Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Sources have said to the BBC that as England went into a second lockdown last autumn, the Prime Minister said he would rather see bodies pile high than take the country into a third lockdown. The Prime Minister denies it. The government was criticised for delaying the lockdown, during which tens of thousands more people died. Labour say the Prime Minister has degraded his office and that his comments are a disgrace. It comes amid a storm of allegations against the Prime Minister by his former closest aide, Dominic Cummings, and a growing row over who paid for the refurbishment of the Prime Minister's Downing Street flat. Here's our political editor, Laura Koonsberg. Yeah, you ready? Politics is not just a game, <laughs> but a constant back and forth over the most serious of decisions. Boris Johnson's alleged in the autumn to have made the most serious of remarks, suggesting around the time of the second lockdown that the bodies of those dying of coronavirus could just pile up. Did he? No, uh, but uh, again, I think the important thing I think that people want to, uh, us to get on and do as a, a government is to make sure that the, the lockdowns work. Yet back in early autumn, it was tense. Ministers and advisers divided over whether to lock down again as coronavirus rose. After arguments, Boris Johnson did agree to reintroduce restrictions. You must stay at home. You may only leave home for specific reasons. But several sources familiar with private conversations at the time say the Prime Minister did then suggest he would let bodies pile high in their thousands rather than repeat the process again. At the time, Dominic Cummings was by Boris Johnson's side. Now the Prime Minister's former chief advisor is very firmly out of government and very firmly on the warpath. There's a list of dangerous claims stacking up at Downing Street's door, not just about the Prime Minister's attitude during the pandemic, but about how contracts were awarded, what promises he made, and how and who paid for an expensive makeover of the Downing Street flat where he lives above the shop. Theresa May gave a rare glimpse of the flat in her last week in office, but the pink sofas and beige carpets were moved out. Thank you very much. When Boris so Johnson and his fiancée yeah, moved in, exactly it's claimed Tory donors initially picked up the tab for tens of thousands of pounds of renovation. If so, that should have been declared, and that hasn't happened yet. And the most senior civil servant in the country wasn't willing to shed much light on it for MPs this afternoon. I asked you whether you were aware whether or not any private donations had been used to re refurbish the flat. I mean, that's a straightforward yes or no, really. So, um, uh, as I said, the Prime Minister has asked me to uh, conduct a review into how, uh, how this has been done and asked that I share the details of those conclusions with, with the committee. After months of claims, Downing Street now says the Prime Minister paid out of his own pocket, but we don't know when or where he got the money. For the opposition, sparks flying in Downing Street are a political gift. We've got lots of investigations going on, but we haven't got anything that's looking at the pattern of behaviour. And day after day, there are new allegations of sleaze, of favours, of privileged access. We need a full investigation that can get to the bottom of that and, most importantly, make recommendations about change, because we need to change the rules. Boris Johnson's sometimes been proud of pushing political convention. Downing Street is adamant that in all senses regulations were followed, but with a long list of claims against him, it isn't yet clear if he was always following the rules. Laura, questions on so many fronts for the Prime Minister. How much trouble is he in? Well, Fiona, I think that this is very tricky territory indeed for the government, not just because of the nature of the stories that have emerged today, but because we've got into a political pattern where day after day other things seem to be coming. There's a sense almost that it's a bit like open season on the government in terms of people who may or may not have an agenda wanting to get things out there in the open that may in some circumstances be quite harmful to the government and Boris Johnson's administration. We should also say Downing Street has repeatedly said that on all of these many different fronts they are sure that nothing was wrong. 
But there has been a sense, perhaps until the last sort of 24, 36 hours, that for most voters, people know that Boris Johnson is somebody who has sometimes been proud of the idea that he bucks convention, that he does things in a different way to other politicians. And many Conservatives I've talked to have suggested that somehow any of the flaws or any of his misbehaviour might somehow be priced in. But there is the odd hint here and there that that confidence is really starting to change. Some of the serious questions that have been posed have not yet been given full answers. And one cabinet minister said to me the real concern is that there's nothing they can do to control it. And no one can be tonight quite sure what or when something else would emerge. Laura at Westminster, thank you. The honesty and integrity of the Prime Minister came under further attack today as Boris Johnson denied making heartless comments about Covid victims. Mr Johnson is accused of declaring that he would rather let bodies pile high in the thousands than enter a third lockdown. Well, today he denied he'd ever said that, but two anonymous witnesses have told ITV News he did. The Prime Minister is also facing some pretty tricky questions over a leak inquiry and exactly who paid for renovations to his Downing Street flat. Here's our political correspondent, Romney Weeks. Are you ready? If the Prime Minister's ping-pong wasn't going well today, his public relations battle is tying him in much worse knots. ITV News has been told by two separate sources that the Prime Minister, shortly after he'd agreed to a second lockdown in October last year, did indeed shout this inside his Downing Street office, that he would let the bodies pile high in their thousands rather than order a third lockdown, words that led to damaging new headlines and words that the Prime Minister categorically denied today. No, uh, but uh, again, I think the important thing I think people want to, uh, us to get on and do as a, a government is to make sure that the, the lockdowns work and, uh, and uh, they have. The latest incendiary leak comes in the wake of the bruising battle between the Prime Minister and his former advisor Dominic Cummings. Today MPs had plenty of questions about that to put to this man, the UK's top civil servant, who had rather less in the way of answers. On the allegation that the Prime Minister wanted donors to pay for renovations to the Downing Street flat. All of this will be um, uh, declared in the uh, proper way. The Prime Minister will make um, relevant declarations. Um, so so, so you're not answering that question now. As for the allegation that the Prime Minister asked if he could stop a leak inquiry relating to the second lockdown. I am constrained in what I can say uh, because it's in the context of an ongoing uh, investigation. I don't wish to be rude, Mr Case, but this is coming across like a badly scripted version of a yes minister. In the Commons, too, Labour was putting on the pressure. Will the minister apologise for the stomach-churning comments that have come out today and urgently announce a public in inquiry into the government's handling of the pandemic? Because this is all about conduct, character and decency. For those like Lobby Akinola, who lost his father to COVID, any suggestion the death toll didn't matter is acutely painful. For me, it's the most devastating thing that's ever happened in my life, and it's something I have to deal with for the rest of my life. And to have the idea that the people who are in charge, the people who are supposed to be protecting us, didn't care is heartbreaking. The Prime Minister might be denying he said any such thing, but he does have a far bigger problem on his hands now if more than one person is prepared to say that actually he did. Romley Weeks, ITV News. And our political editor Robert Peston is here. So, Robert, explain what exactly do you know about what the Prime Minister said or didn't say back in the autumn? So, uh... At the end of October, I am told by two sources uh, that he was furious at what he felt to be... He was being forced, he felt, to take the country back into lockdown, didn't want to do that, and they heard him shouting. He was in his study, they were outside, uh, and they heard him shouting, uh, you know, this extraordinary remark about preferring to see bodies piled high by the thousand and have a third lockdown. Of course, we did have a third lockdown. Now, Prime Minister has denied it. Uh, it was, of course, reported in the Daily Mail today. The two people I talked to said they are not the sources for the Daily Mail. Uh, therefore, there could well be three sources. And they also say that if push comes to the shove at some point, if the Prime Minister continues to deny it, he will, they will go 
on the record. So, very uncomfortable for the Prime Minister. Yeah, it could be very awkward for him, couldn't it? And this isn't the only thing that's overshadowing uh, him at the moment, because this is business about the renovation of his flat, which Romney mentioned in her piece. That's right. So, I've learned something, uh, I think, profoundly important uh, just half an hour ago, uh, which is that uh, the initial payments for the flat were made by the Cabinet Office, obviously, because this was for furnishings and decoration in his home. This was not proper for the government to pay for it. So the Tory party itself, Conservative Party Central Office, paid back the Central Office. Now, many people would also say it's not right for political donations to be used to fund the, the Prime Minister's lifestyle. Now, the Tory party has told me Tonight, the Prime Minister has, re has paid for everything, which means effectively he's repaid the Tory party, but it, is effect it was a loan from the Tory party. And if the Tory party lent money to the Prime Minister, I'm told the Tory party did lend to the Prime Minister, that must be disclosed. The Prime Minister, under the ministerial, ministerial code, m must disclose that. He hasn't yet. OK. To be continued then, Robert, yeah? Thank you. In other news, Boris Johnson has denied saying last autumn that he would rather let the bodies pile high than have another lockdown after the latest in a series of leaks that have rocked Downing Street. And in response to another of those leaks on how he paid for the refurbishment of his Downing Street flat, Mr Johnson said if there was any declaration to make, he would do so in, quotes, due course. Labour's Rachel Reeves accused the Prime Minister of, quotes, corrupting the standards of public life. We'll hear from her in a moment. But first, let's go over to our political editor, Gary Gibbon, in Westminster. Gary. Well, who you believe on whether Boris Johnson talked about bodies piling high or not probably uh, depends on uh, where you were in the political spectrum and who you supported in the uh, first place. But Boris Johnson has emphatically said he didn't say it, and really the only thing that could trump that is an audio tape. Now, we know that Dominic Cummings' uh, friends think uh, he probably did record uh, some meetings, some exchanges. If there was a tape uh, which undermined what the uh, Prime Minister has just said, uh, that, that would be pretty damaging. But you kind of think you might have seen it already if such a thing did exist. On the number 10 flat, the government is meant to pay for the first £30,000 uh, worth of uh, work that is done for an incoming Prime Minister on the flat. It's quite clear that Boris Johnson has expended quite a bit of effort trying to uh, make sure that someone else pays for uh, the costs that uh, he's incurred above that. What has actually happened behind the scenes? Well, we seem to know now that Boris Johnson has somehow paid the additional money, but how did he pay it and what was he trying to get to happen in the first place? Did someone else pay for it in the first instance? All of that is very murky. We learned pretty well nothing from the Cabinet Secretary Simon Case and his evidence to MPs uh, today on that. You also have swirling around the last week's story about the James Dyson texts uh, to Boris Johnson and the implication of the uh, story from Dominic Cummings that effectively Boris Johnson's fiance cancelled a leak inquiry. Does all this affect Boris Johnson? We know that a lot of his uh, supporters price in a cavalier attitude to rules. But here's an interesting thought with Dominic Cummings. He knows how to organise a campaign grid. In the 2016 referendum, he held back some of the heaviest bombardment until later in the campaign. Have we only seen the beginning of this? Campaigning in Wales ahead of next Thursday's elections, the Prime Minister refused to engage with questions about whether he'd initially secretly got a Tory party donor to pay tens of thousands of pounds the redecoration of his flat above 11 Downing Street. If there's anything to be said about that, any, any declaration to be made, that will of course be made uh, in due course. The Cabinet Secretary, Simon Case, crossed the road from Downing Street to Parliament to face questions on that and other matters from MPs. But the MPs didn't feel they got answers. Are you aware yourself whether any private donations have been used to cover the cost of refurbishing the flat at Downing Street. So w what, I'm, uh, what I'm happy to tell you is that um, the Prime Minister has asked me to conduct uh, a review. I asked you whether you were aware whether or not any private donations had been used to re refurbish the flat. I mean, that's a straightforward yes or no, really. So. Um, I uh, as I said, the Prime Minister has asked me to uh, conduct a review into how, uh, how this has been done. 
Boris Johnson's former aide Dominic Cummings alleged last week that the Prime Minister risked breaking the law, trying to use secret donations to redecorate the flat at the top of 11 Downing Street. The Theresa May furnishings were not to Boris Johnson's fiancé's taste. And an interior designer was hired with a track record of a very different style. The Prime Minister was also facing allegations that after agreeing the second lockdown last autumn, he said he would rather see the bodies pile high in their thousands than impose a third lockdown. Boris Johnson denied saying those words. No, uh, but uh, again, I think the important thing I think that people want to, uh, us to get on and do as a, a government is to make sure that the, the lockdowns work. The Prime Minister made a decision in that meeting to trigger a second lockdown. He made a subsequent decision to trigger a third lockdown. This is a Prime Minister who was in a hospital himself in intensive care. The idea that he would say any such thing, I find incredible. I was in that room. I never heard language of that kind. Based on my experiences of him, I don't find it impossible to believe. On the contrary, it is all too believable. Number 10 was also trying to head off allegations around the leak in October last year that a second lockdown was coming. The Prime Minister felt these headlines were designed to bounce him into the lockdown. Dominic Cummings last week said Boris Johnson tried to shut down the inquiry into the leak because it was pointing to a friend of his fiancée. Could you tell the committee uh, if essentially what uh, Mr Cummings has said is true? What I can say is the investigation is ongoing. And this is a clear indication that the source or sources haven't been identified. Given the time that has now passed, I think it's probable that the team will not successfully identify the source or sources. Boris Johnson has told friends he thinks Dominic Cummings is intent on destroying him. Some who've known Dominic Cummings for years say on that, Boris Johnson is absolutely right. Well, we have asked the government and Conservative MPs for an interview, but no one was available. Earlier, I spoke to the Shadow Cabinet Office Minister, Rachel Reeves, and I asked whether reports that Tory donors had funded the Number 10 refurb even mattered. The issue here is about secretly trying to raise money from Conservative Party donors to pay for a refurbishment of private accommodation Which has been in denied. 10 Downing Street. What is, the Prime Minister is saying is that he is now paying for that. What we have not learnt yet is who paid those invoices. It may be the case that Boris Johnson is paying that money back, but who paid up front and what was the intention of the Prime Minister? Because it looks like the intention was to get Tory party donors to pay for the refurbishment. That goes against all of the rules, especially if that wasn't declared properly in the first place. And of course, and the Prime Minister has thinking... said today that any and... declarations that need to be made will be made. I mean, are you saying that British politics has now reached the level, say, of Italy? Well, there is supposed to be an independent advisor on ministerial interests. That independent advisor resigned five months ago because his report into Priti Patel's bullying behaviour at the Home Office was ignored. There's been no one in that role. The Register of Ministers' Financial Interests is supposed to be published twice a year. It was only published once last year in July and nothing at all since then. So there is no transparency about the financial interests of ministers. The independent advisor on ministerial interests must be appointed and that register must be published so that we can see any real or perceived conflicts of interests at the heart of this government. And that is something that the public and voters have not been able to see now for many, many months. I mean, when you talk about government scrutiny, of course, the select committees are very important. As an exercise in government scrutiny, today's select committee didn't really get very, very far at all. The Cabinet Secretary, Simon Case, taking no comment to a new level. Do you have confidence him, in him? Would a Labour government keep him in place? I think that it's really important, and this is why Labour called for this uh, just last week, to have a fully independent inquiry into not just what happened at Greensill, but the whole extent of lobbying and crony contracts at the heart of this government. And in the end, it's up to civil servants to advise and ministers to make decisions. And we need the Prime Minister, the Health Secretary and the Chancellor to answer important questions about their involvement 
in lobbying scandals and the handing out of contracts to friends and donors of the Conservative Party? I mean, there are at least, I think it is, eight inquiries into the Green Cell and David Cameron's lobbying. How many more inquiries do you need? The problem is, is all of these inquiries are looking at different parts of the same puzzle. What we want to see and what Conservative MPs voted against in Parliament is a comprehensive inquiry looking at this whole issue of sleaze and cronyism, which is increasingly engulfing this Conservative government. Rachel Reid, thanks very much for talking to us today. Thank you. Well, with me now is Rachel Sylvester, political columnist at The Times, and Peter Oborn, former chief political commentator of The Daily Telegraph and author of Assault on Truth, Boris Johnson, Donald Trump, and the emergence of a new moral barbarism. Thanks to both of you for joining us this evening. Rachel Sylvester first, if you would. Downing Street is insisting Mr Johnson paid for the flat himself, that anything that needs to be declared will be declared. Is this the end of it? No, I don't think it is, because I think this goes to the question of Boris Johnson's character and his integrity. Uh, and his former aide, Dominic Cummings, who was until very recently his right-hand man, is questioning his integrity and his approach to ethics. Uh, he calls him unethical. Uh, and I think that the support for Boris Johnson was wide but shallow at the general election. And people thought of him, uh, it's factored in that he was seen as a bit of a cad and a bounder, a bit of a rogue, but he was a lovable rogue. He was their rogue, he was on their side. Uh, and I think the problem is if people start to feel as if he's behaving as if there's one rule for the elite and another rule for the rest of us, then that that will, people will turn on him quite quickly. That support is very fragile. Um, Peter Oban, the title of your book perhaps tells us precisely where you feel Boris Johnson stands in terms of the spectrum of truth. The question is, at what point do these things start to damage him? I think, by the way, I mean, I list dozens of lies or told by Mr Johnson, not one of, it's three months ago since it was published, not a single dot or comma of that book has been challenged. Now, I'm, um, I would say it's damaged him already very greatly. There's this view out there, sort of, people in London talk about how people don't care about right and wrong. I refuse to accept that. Ordinary voters, ordinary people really care about truth and falsehood, really care, care about being honesty. Uh, if you think about what we've learnt so far about the what can only be called the moral cesspit which Downing Street has become, uh, Mr Johnson would not be accepted to do business with now. Nobody would give him a loan. He is so proven to be a repeated and habitual liar but the that it's very, very hard for people to take him seriously as Prime Minister of his country. Just on the point that Rachel Sylvester made, though, that people price in the fact that he's a bit of a cad, and th many people like that about him, that he, he rolls with the rules, shall we say? Well, I, I don't think, as I say, I just simply don't think that people want that in a British Prime Minister. What is new this weekend, though? Something has happened. We had a sort of almost like a Millie Dowler moment. You remember the Rupert Murdoch phone hacking scandal when it just went on and on and on and suddenly uh, something really bit home. And I think that these remarks by the Prime Minister about bodies piling high. Now, all of us have been affected by this terrible disease. Many of us have lost loved ones and suffered them ourselves. Okay. Now, though that call the callousness of that remark uh, against the background of Mr Johnson's proven that, negligence in any case... Obviously, that remark has been denied um, and, and... It's very important it's been denied. Now, no, what we've had No, hold on a second, Peter. I want to ask Rachel something. That, that remark has clearly been denied. But, Rachel Sylvester, do you believe that this tipping point has been reached? I think we don't know yet. I think it depends what evidence Dominic Cummings produces in the select committee meeting where he, t he addresses MPs. And he's talked about uh, being willing to show his emails and WhatsApp messages and that sort of thing. And if he produces evidence that shows that the Prime Minister, people died as a result of decisions the Prime Minister took, I think that would be incredibly damaging and dangerous. Uh, I think we're close to a tipping point. I'm not sure it's absolutely been reached yet, 
And, uh, and Peter Oborn, I mean, the ministers and MPs have been out saying endlessly, doing the round, saying on the doorstep, they believe it doesn't matter. When do you think we will know whether it does matter or not? You know, you look at the polling at the weekend and they're up nine points. Well, the poll I saw actually saw the Conservatives down five points, and that was before the latest um, events. You've got another major poll. It does bring you on to a point about Conservative MPs. You know, if you are out there supporting the Prime Minister, you're now finding yourself into a situ situation where you're very close to having to perjure yourself in order to support the Prime Minister of this country. As a Tory MP, I'd be getting, or let alone Cabinet Minister, I'd be getting very nervous now that my own personal reputation and integrity is being sacrificed to support a morally corrupt British Prime Minister. Rachel Sylvester, do you, do you agree with that view? Well, it does reach a point, I mean, it happened with Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour MPs at the last election, where MPs found it incredibly difficult to support their leader and they found their own integrity on the line as well. I think what the, the danger for Boris Johnson is if MPs feel he's no longer a winner, they will turn on him. I was speaking to one former cabinet minister recently who said there are a lot of plotters hiding in a lot of bushes just waiting to pounce. And of course Boris Johnson has denied many of the accusations that have been put to, uh, this evening but thanks to both of you for joining us. Thank you. Accusations of sleaze and leaky quotes, denials of misspending and cronyism. What does this series of stories tell us about the Prime Minister's behaviour, those who are out to get him and the public tolerance for politicians who step round the rules? Also tonight, India's surging Covid crisis is worsening. How much of this is down to a lack of global strategy? And Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe faces another year imprisoned in a Tehran jail. Is she now becoming a pawn in the Iran deal diplomacy as well as an outstanding British debt? Hello, good evening. This is a story about private donations and political favours, about things said off record and things reported in public. It's about leaks and sources, declarations and denials and oh so many inquiries. It's also a story of revenge. Two men who used to rule Downing Street as one, now very much divorced. There's no one who can create as much chaos as an enemy who was once a friend. But don't be confused by all the different strands here, because fundamentally, it's all asking something very simple. How do we expect those in power to behave? What do we demand of our leaders? And are the public willing to forgive it all as the nation moves onwards and upwards? Or do we want to get to the truth of what happens? Let's begin with our political editor, Nick Watt. And Nick, if you can take us through the day and what you actually think has cut through. Well, Emily, there's real mixed opinions amongst Conservative MPs. Some are saying this is absolutely not cutting through. They're saying there's very few emails from constituents, no anger on the doorstep as there was over Dominic Cummings' lockdown trip to Barnard Castle last year. Now, the Tories who do fear that it will cut through, they believe it'll be over the refurbishment of the Downing Street flat. And one former cabinet minister said to me, there's a danger that it could be like the expenses scandal. It's the simple stuff that cuts through. Why did you need to spend so much money on a fancy in interior designer could be the thinking of voters. And, and then this former cabinet minister then highlighted the way in which the Conservative Party initially paid, it is reported, the extra cost of the refurbishment on, on top of the amount allowed for in public funds. And I was told this by this former cabinet minister, the Conservative Party simply doesn't have tens of thousands of pounds sitting around. So they've raised the money and then what the party has done with those funds is basically money laundering. It's important to say that this is criticism of the way that the party has handled the money. It is not criticism of the way the donation was made. That has been done in a completely above board way. Now, Downing Street is saying that the Prime Minister has now paid those extra costs himself and they add that if any further declarations need to be made, they will be made in the usual way. It's very easy for the PM supporters to say this is about revenge, a friend who's now become an enemy. Uh, how true is that? Well, I was speaking to one person today who knows both Boris Johnson and Dominic Cummings very well, and they rolled their eyes and said, what did anyone expect? They said that Dominic Cummings has a habit of acting in an incendiary way and that he was really angry after his departure from Downing Street. And then this person said that Boris Johnson walked straight into a trap 
after that briefing against Dominic Cummings last week, which prompted the inevitable response in his blog. Now, the view in government is that they always knew that a Dominic Cummings explosion would uh, be coming. They knew, in fact, everyone at Westminster appeared to know that Dominic Cummings spent most of last year raging against Boris Johnson for failing to lock down quickly and fast enough. He was talking last autumn of how the second wave was entirely predictable because of the opening up that took place um, over, the summer, uh, over the summer. So in Downing Street, they thought that the key moment would be his appearance for a joint select committee at the end of next month. They thought that could be dangerous, so not a bad idea to have the row out in the open now. I understand that Dominic Cummings sees his appearance before that select committee as absolutely crucial. I'm told that if he has evidence uh, in written or audio form to back up any of the claims he's making, that would be the place to place them, either in oral evidence or in written evidence to the committee before he appears. But he could go earlier. He went very hard last week in that blog um, because he thought that Downing Street was effectively accusing him of criminal behaviour. That, of course, was the allegation that he was the so-called chatty rat who'd leaked the details of the plan for a lockdown last Last autumn, he emphatically denies that, and he says he was told by the Cabinet Secretary it was not him. Today, the Cabinet Secretary said that that inquiry is still open, though we may never know the identity of the leaker. So look, this is a row, Emily, that began with David Cameron lobbying, and it's now lapping at the gates of number 10. Exiled from the centre of power, but still a brooding presence with the ability to inflict severe political damage. It's only a few months since Dominic Cummings experienced a spectacular fall from grace. He lost a power struggle over the internal workings of Number 10, but there had been months of tensions over coronavirus. He argued for tough lockdowns. The Prime Minister was wary. And now, highly damaging details of Boris Johnson's alleged thinking after he lost an internal argument and agreed to a second lockdown last autumn. No more lockdowns. Let the bodies pile high in their thousands, the Prime Minister reportedly bellowed. <laughs> Boris Johnson, who did end up imposing that third lockdown in January, firmly denied that he had ever uttered such incendiary words. No. Uh, but, and he was keen uh, again, to move on to other areas. Important thing I think that people want to, uh, us to get on and do as a, a government is to make sure that the, the lockdowns work. We're dealing with one of the most serious decisions this Prime Minister and any government has had to face. People a strong defence from Michael Gove. The Prime Minister made a decision in that meeting to trigger a second lockdown. He made a subsequent decision to trigger a third lockdown. This is a Prime Minister who was in a hospital himself in intensive care. The idea that he would say any such thing, I find incredible. I was in that room. I never heard language of that kind. The open warfare between Boris Johnson and Dominic Cummings, the formidable partnership which arguably did more than anything else to deliver Brexit, has opened up a second and potentially dangerous front. Dominic Cummings has accused the Prime Minister of devising a foolish plan to get Tory donors to help with the costs of refurbishing his Downing Street flat after the costs of a bijou interior designer exceeded the £30,000 available in public funds. A difficult appearance on that for the young Cabinet Secretary. I think, as the uh, Prime Minister um, has said, all of this will be um, uh, declared in the uh, proper way. The Prime Minister will make um, relevant declarations. What I'm, uh, what I'm happy to tell you is that um, the Prime Minister has asked me to conduct uh, a review because I've not been involved um, uh, directly in this. The Prime Minister has asked me to conduct a, a review. Me, An issue with potential to cut through, according to one Whitehall watcher. I think the big question that a lot of political commentators are asking is, is the flat redecoration actually the thing that's going to be most problematic for the Prime Minister? Uh, because it is something that does not necessarily speak to a lot of people's lives during the pandemic. Obviously, everyone working from home, um, home redecoration may or may not have been a priority. Is that something that actually is going to turn the public um, more interested in this wider question about proper behaviour in government, and in particular, whether it will be damaging for the Prime Minister.
The MP who raised the issue in Parliament today believes Boris Johnson is failing to observe proper conventions. What this tells you about the Boris Johnson government is they have absolutely uh, no respect, no regard uh, for the ministerial code, for those, those principles, those Nolan principles of how you're supposed to behave in public life, about integrity and the public interest and leadership and honesty. None of these things uh, seem to matter to Boris Johnson and his government. A dark mood in Downing Street after what was described to me as a dicey day. Number 10 will hope that rows over lockdowns and a flat refurbishment will not cut through with voters. But sometimes there is a long tail. Nick Watt there. Well, we invited the government on the programme. They said no. I'm now joined by the former Shadow Chancellor and member of the Public Administration Committee, John McDonnell, former Chair of the House of Commons Procedure Committee, Charles Walker, and the Director of Centre for Study of Corruption at Sussex University, Professor Elizabeth David Barrett. It's good to have you all. And Charles Walker, if I can start with you, perhaps, and that uh, quote from Dominic Cummings, um, who claimed that the Prime Minister had been unethical, foolish and possibly illegal to get donors to pay for a refurbishment of the flat. Is Cummings wrong? Well, I, I, I have to say, I think the refurbishment of the flat is the least important issue that's being covered, because at the end of the day, it didn't cost the taxpayer a penny. Either the Prime Minister's paid for it or Tory party donors paid for it. I don't really care who paid for it, as long as my constituents didn't pay for it. So it's cost the taxpayer nothing. Well, to, the to be fair, The taxpayers get irritated <laughs> when, they end up, when they end up funding things. So I'm sorry. It's, it's, to me, I just think it's, it's... I just can't understand why you and the media are so obsessed by taxpayers not funding a redecoration. Me and the media and Simon Case, who said there's going to be an inquiry into the money that was spent. From what we know, 30,000, which is the public allowance of taxpayers' money, was spent. That's fine. Then we understand that it was paid right. for possibly by a donor through CCHQ and it was only latterly that the Prime Minister then paid that money back. One of your former colleagues, a former Cabinet Minister, described that as basic money laundering, the transfer of the money through the system in that way. So Rubbish. why is it not important? But because it isn't. The taxpayer hasn't... Sorry, I'm, I'm confused. Did the taxpayer the 30000 It was confusing the question you put to me. Has the taxpayer paid the 30000 or have they paid part of the 58000 with Tory party donors picking up the rest or the Prime Minister? I'm, I'm not entirely sure what the issue is here. The fact of the matter is there was an allowance that may or may not have been spent, but the taxpayer's not out of pocket. So taxpayers are worried when they're paying for refurbishments. If they're not paying for refurbishments, and private donors are, it tends to be of little concern to the taxpayer, to be perfectly honest, okay. despite what former cabinet ministers may or may not say. And it doesn't worry you. I think we have confirmed that, that 30,000 of it, which was the allowance, was paid for by the taxpayer. We'll put that on one side. Right, right. But okay. it, it which, does suggest... Which is allowable, yeah. Of course, which does suggest unethical borrowing though. I guess what I'm asking you is you will know how backbenchers are feeling. You've chaired the 1922 committee. You'll know about the texts from and with Dyson. You'll know about the reckless quotes about human life. You'll know about discussing the halting of an inquiry that could be embarrassing. Does none of that alarm you at all? So, so, Emily, I've been on your programme and, and you will know that I'm not a signed up member of the Boris Johnson fan club. I've been often voting against my own government. But we are talking about a man that nearly killed himself last year while in office trying to navigate this crisis. We're talking about a man who's delivered the most success, successful vaccine programme of any major developed country in the world. We're talking about a man who bent over backwards to get ventilators made. Can you imagine if we hadn't had the ventilators made, what you would be saying? So I'm sorry, I can't really understand. There are many okay. things I can take issue with the Prime Minister about, but none of the things you've mentioned to me tonight it's are things that really I'm, I'm actually going to get too cross I, about. I just suggest that a lot of the public would, would believe that you can do both. You know, you, you can be a Prime Minister with a successful vaccination programme no. and also be empathetic to loss of life and also not be open to accusations of cronyism or corruption. You can do both. But, but, but look, at the end of the day, we needed ventilators. We were short tens of thousands. He had to get them built. He did what any person would do. He said, right, get them built, and I don't care how we're going to do it, but we've got to get them built. That is not wrong in itself. He wanted to save lives. He actually put his own health at risk to save lives. 
his vaccine programme, this country's okay. vaccine programme, is the most successful of any developed economy. Let's if you want to find issue with the Prime Minister, I'm happy to come on and do that, but not on these issues. Fine, let me bring in John McDonnell um, to, to respond to some of those thoughts, uh, John McDonnell, that the Prime Minister uh, put his own life on the line to, to save lives and did what he needed to at the time. Let's be clear. And I have a lot of respect for Charles, and he is an independent person. But on this one, I'm sorry, I disagree with him. Boris Johnson was a prime minister who initially ignored the threat of COVID, then ignored consistently the advice given to him about the promptness of lockdowns. And as a result of that, I believe thousands of people lost their lives. Nevertheless, that's the record. And that's why the families of people who've died as a result, tragically died as a result of COVID, want a proper inquiry so that we can learn the lessons from that. However, this, this is a diff, slightly different matter we're dealing with now. And let me try and explain to Charles why I think all these matters are quite important. They individually may seem insignificant, but actually I believe, I believe, and I think his colleagues agree as well, that the general public actually do expect some level of decency and honesty from their politicians. We went through the expenses scandal and people were shocked and horrified at what was going on. And I think at the moment, people begin to get anxious about what's going on surrounding the prime minister. The issue around the flat is about being honest and open. £30,000 came from the public purse. That was where he was allowed. He wanted something different other than John Lewis. Well, actually, most of us would be really pleased to shop at John Lewis anyway. But he wanted something more than that. And it looks as though he simply got the Conservative Party to ask donors to give money to pay the rest. Why can't he be honest and just explain that rather than delay it? The reason he doesn't is because actually people out there think, and I think quite rightfully, there's no such thing as a free lunch in politics. People pay money up and donate on the basis of the hope of something in return. Except, That's the fear the general public have about this behaviour. Except, John, to go back to Charles Walker's point, which was that if the taxpayer isn't footing the bill, fundamentally, they don't really care. This isn't going to cut through. If it's a dispute between I, CCHQ and the Prime Minister and a Tory Emily, donor, they don't care. Emily, there's two points here. One is whether it cuts through or not. To be honest, I'm not bothered. It's up to the general public and individuals. I actually do think... I do think ordinary working people do expect the Prime Minister to be honest and decent and open. And they don't like the idea of backdoor donations, particularly around an issue like this. They just don't like it. And that's my view. But there's something beyond that. And this is the responsibility that Charles and I have and my colleagues on the Public Administration Committee, which is our job is to uphold standards in public life. And when we see those standards beginning to slip. Our job is to blow the whistle to make sure it doesn't slip any further. And if you saw what happened on the Public Administration Committee today, it was Conservative members as many as much as Labour members who actually were looking pretty aghast at what was going on in number 10 around different contracts, the appointment of Lex Greensill, apparently without a contract, able to advise government in number 10, even though he could have been a beneficiary what? of some of the policies that he was developing and that that thread ran all the way through the discussions we had today okay and on a cross-party basis let me bring in, we're worried about the slippage of standards let me bring in uh, professor liz david barrett because that question of upholding standards comes down to proving that wrongdoing has happened I, there's so many strands of the stories um liz david barrett and, and so many inquiries now ongoing how do we know what if anything was done wrong well, I think one of the difficulties is that we don't know exactly what's happened here. So um, we've not, you know, the government has not been very transparent about who exactly was paying what to whom, um, and they haven't really disclosed the interests, just like um, they haven't met their obligations to publish the list of ministers' financial interests. They're supposed to publish that twice a year, and they haven't published it since July of last year. And the point of these transparency rules is not just that we see whether decisions are being influenced by, for example, receiving a gift or a donation. But it's also that you know, the transparency and openness allows us to be confident that our public office holders are not being influenced and that all their decisions are being made in the public interest.
if you're in public office, transparency is actually your way to show that you're not corrupt. Can you say, hand on heart, Charles Walker, that this doesn't worry you? This, this perception that there is so little transparency or accountability with what's going on? I tell you what worries me, Emily, is that we've passed swinging legislation over the past year without any meaningful debate, virtually no debate at all. What worries me is that still only a handful of members of Parliament are actually turning up to the Palace of Westminster, the House of Commons, to represent their constituents. They think it's acceptable to sit at home but, reading but speeches me, down their Zoom cameras. So a, I'm sorry. It, 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 a, no, it is, no, it's not. It is about the government of this country. It is about people turning up to do their job, I'm afraid, at the House of Commons. And that, I'm afraid, is a far bigger concern to me and most of my electorate, I think, than who paid for wallpaper at number 10. Elizabeth David I mean, it Barrett. really is. And it is so British, isn't it? It's so British that we're getting aerated um, about private donors paying for a sofa and wallpaper and not about the fact that our parliament is barely meeting yep. and the government is introducing legislation with virtually zero scrutiny when it does bring legislation to the floor of the house it gets waved through by the uh, labor party okay, so um, there are bigger issues to worry about than wallpaper can i ask um elizabeth to respond to that in terms of what the public should be caring about I think you know, the public needs to care about whether public office holders are living up to those principles that we have. So openness, honesty, integrity. Um, you know, these principles, there are seven of them in all, and they're all there for a good reason. But one of the problems is that public office holders are not living up to those principles. And I think we've come to a point where we can say that actually we can't really trust people to stick to those principles and we need probably more explicit and clearer rules. Um, to to make sure that they do live up to their standards. You know, one of the problems here is you know, when someone, particularly ministers, when you become a minister for the first time, you've got a lot of space to make really big decisions. And although that's always been the case, what has changed in the last 10, 20 years is that there's so much more blurring between government decision making and the private sector. So ministers are in a position where their decisions are going to be affecting private interests which might overlap with their own interests and where they've got people in business who are very close to the government. So what we have is a situation with a lot of potential for conflicts of interest. OK. Thank you all very much indeed. Thanks for joining us this evening. Appreciate it.